Uh, yeah, so as you heard, my name is Michal Kaluzhne, and I would like to talk to you today about reverse engineering mobile apps, how to do it, why people like me want to do it, and how people like you, mobile developers, can prevent people like me from accessing your app. And a little bit about me, uh, I have 50 years of experience as a software developer. Uh, my first Hello World was written on an Atari 65. Actually, it's a very old 8-bit computer. And the good thing about this computer is that it had built-in basic interpreter. And with that computer, I got like a stack of tapes that someone recorded with the basic programs. And another good thing about basing is that you could load those programs and see the source code before running them. So this is where I started you know, looking at others' work to try to learn how to actually uh, write computer programs. And uh, this interest in uh, reverse engineering uh, computer games uh, brought me into the World of Warcraft modding community, uh, where we look at the uh, game data, game client, the networking protocols. And also, I'm um, a part of the Pokemon Go reverse engineering team. Back in the day, uh, when the game just launched, we were the first ones to actually understand uh, how the app is talking to the server and be able to write uh, bots or other software. Uh, during this time, I found several vulnerabilities in uh, Blizzard's Battle.net service. Uh, also a really big one in the Disney mobile app and uh, many others. Unfortunately, as with those big companies, they don't really want you to talk about what you found. So uh, maybe later we can have a quick chat, you know, somewhere behind the curtain so I can give you some more details. Uh, so what we're going to be talking about today, uh, yeah, first we're going to have a quick introduction, what exactly is reverse engineering, uh, what does it mean to reverse engineer, uh, and then we're going to go straight into it. So we're going to look at the tools that we can use. Uh, we will look about uh, how do you access the code of the application, how do you inject your own code that you would like uh, to be run alongside, and then how you can prevent it from happening. And then at the end, we're going to have a quick epilogue about what we learn and a quick Q&A session. So what is reverse engineering? Well, if you know what engineering is, it's taking an idea and building a product out of it. So in our computer uh, world, like we have uh, the idea, the blueprint uh, of source code, and then we tr uh, tra transform it into a running program. Reverse engineering is the opposite of that. You take the program that you got somewhere and you try to find this original b blueprint. You try to learn as much about the uh, program as possible. And uh, people usually think of uh, reverse engineering as of the, the compilation process. And uh, what is the compilation? The compilation is, again, a reverse process of compilation. So uh, when you compile a program, you take source code, you compile it into the machine code for whatever uh, machine you target. Uh, the compilation is the opposite. You take the compiled machine code and you try to get some approximation of the original source code. And uh, when people uh, start reverse engineering, uh, they usually go one of two routes. Uh, they either go with the dynamic or static analysis. Uh, the dynamic analysis is uh, a process where you run the application in the real time, and you basically attach a debugger or another tool similar to that where you can uh, stop and pause execution, you can uh, read and write memory uh, at your will, you can you know, change the order of execution of the app. Uh, and that's, uh, that's a quick and dirty way if you want to do something right now, very quickly, just a proof of concept. Uh, the opposite of that is the static analysis where you don't run the program, you just uh, look at the binary and you try to understand how it would be actually executed without executing it first. Uh, static analysis is usually used uh, in, uh, for example, security research. Like if you find a virus, you don't really want to run it on your machine. Even if you have like a clean uh, environment, you would rather first know what's going on there before you start running it. And uh, usually people mix and match those two approaches because, uh, like I said, dynamic is a good thing to do quickly, but if you want a persistent solution, you need to go with the static way. And uh, what tools are we going to use to to do that? Well, for the static analysis, uh, basically the gold standard is the IDA, 
the problem with the IDA is that it's a professional suit of programs and the license can, can cost you starting from 1,000 euros up to hundreds of thousands depending on the features that you, uh, you, you need. Uh, like the, feature, the features are the support for different architectures, uh, better the compilers, uh, better APIs and plenty of uh, third-party plugins. There is a free version, but it's more of a trial because it only supports uh, x86 at the moment and it doesn't have the decompiler built in. Uh, so I wouldn't recommend that if you want to start. Like th this is a really powerful tool for later, but right now I would definitely recommend a hopper. Hopper is a much cheaper tool. It's still paid. It's still around 100 euros at the moment, but it also has support for uh, majority of the most popular architectures. It has a quite good uh, decompiler and uh, it's a multi-platform tool, so it's available on uh, both Windows, or Windows uh, Linux and Mac. And that for the static analysis of uh, compiled binaries. If you work with uh, Android, like if you work with Android app that you are trying to reverse engineer, Android is running on top of a virtual machine called Dalvik and Dalvik uses uh, its own assembly language called Smalley. So there is a uh, disassembler for Smalley that is called Bug Smalley. Uh, and there is also a decompiler for Java class files uh, called JDGUI. Uh, JDGUI is quite an old software. Like I think the last uh, release was in 2015, but it's still uh, good enough and still handles uh, Java files really well, even the ones compiled uh, from Kotlin. Uh, for the dynamic analysis, I would highly recommend Frida. Frida um, is kind of a joke on the IDA uh, name because it's a free, uh, free software. And uh, they provide you with a lot of uh, helper tools and bindings uh, to work, like to modify the app while it's running. And it has bindings for Objective-C and Java. Uh, the Swift support is still experimental, but it should arrive there soon. And uh, Frida has a very extensive uh, scripting support where you can automate a lot of this work and uh, try write, uh, you can write scripts that you know gonna guess what's gonna uh, like uh, where you actually want to write some values to the memory, for example. And uh, after you analyze the app, after you did the modification that you wanted, if you want to run it on an uh, actual device, you need to uh, repackage the application and resign it, especially on iOS, because you cannot just install uh, and sign application on iOS without a jailbreak. So for Android, I recommend APK tool, and it can uh, handle all of the uh, unpacking and packing and signing. Uh, it's really powerful one in uh, all in one uh, solution. For iOS, um, there's Cydia Impactor. It's a jailbreak tool but it can also use to resign uh, whatever binary you throw at it and it will install it happily on your device. Uh, so we have the, we know what we more or less uh, gonna do. We have the tools, but how we, do we actually get the application? Well, ob obviously if you have a jbroken or root devices, uh, the world is your oyster. You can do whatever you want, so you can basically extract uh, any data uh, and the operating system can say no to that. Uh, if you don't ac have access to such a device, uh, another good solution is the public uh, Play Store and uh, Apple, uh, sorry, uh, App Store's mirrors. There is uh, plenty of them available. My two favorite ones are the iPhone Cake and APK Fine. Uh, the good thing about those is that they not only uh, host the newest version of the application, but also the older revisions, uh, something that you cannot get from the uh, real app store so it's good like if you would like to see how the application changed over the time you can do this uh, with the help of those two websites and another very interesting uh, way of accessing the uh, binary is that plenty of companies right now uh, publish those uh, beta or alpha builds uh, publicly to to their testers uh, and usually they uh, are built with the debug configuration, so they co uh, contain a lot of more information. Uh, and it's really helpful to see what you can expect in the next release of the app. So with those three approaches, you can get the historical versions, you can get the current version, and probably the upcoming one. So now we have the code. What exactly, how do we exactly mix it with the, with the tools that we uh, have? So 
here's this uh, table of uh, different languages uh, and what we can find in the binary. So for Objective-C and Swift, uh, usually the binary will be compiled into uh, binary code, which we can disassemble into the ARM assembly. Unless you have the uh, simulator app, then you can get the x86 assembly. Uh, Objective-C and Swift uh, binaries uh, contain partial symbols. That's due to the uh, way the Objective-C runtime is built. It requires this metadata uh, to be present for features like swizzling uh, or uh, notifications. Uh, this, uh, it's not everything about the, like it doesn't contain all of the information about the original source code, but there is a uh, bit like class names and method names that you can uh, usually get. For Swift, it's a little bit different because Swift doesn't require that metadata. The compiler basically can remove it at the compile time. But because most of the apps that we write for iOS uh, still use old Objective-C frameworks like UIKit, so you always need to, like almost always, you need to subclass from the NS object. And if you do that, then you get that metadata because your class needs to work with Objective-C runtime. Uh, for the features like uh, enums, generics, the uh, symbols might be missing, but for the majority of the code, you will still have them in Swift. So difficulty, iOS, uh, medium to hard, depending on the language used. Compared to Android, where basically it's super easy, and if I want to reverse engineer an app and they have iOS and Android version, I'm just, I'm just going to go straight to the Android because it saves so much time because, first of all, the machine code is much easier to read. Uh, Smiley is not supposed to be human readable, but as I will show you later, it's not really that terrible compared to Assembler. Uh, thanks to a very dy dynamic nature of Java, the, there are full symbols available most of the time. And yeah, the difficulty, like I said, is super easy. Like, I would recommend starting with Android if you are interested in this topic. Uh, if you are doing non-native uh, solutions, uh, like you use uh, React Native or uh, C, sorry, Unity with C Sharp, C Sharp is very similar to Java. Uh, so again, a little bit different machine language, but full symbols, uh, and there's plenty of tools available because C Sharp is uh, very popular on desktop uh, desktop operating system, systems, and there's plenty of apps built in it, and there's plenty of hackers trying to crack those apps. Uh, so there basically, like there exist IDEs where you have code completion for your reverse engineering. Uh, for JavaScript, it's actually, I was actually surprised because everyone always says, oh yeah, you are writing JavaScript, you are pushing your source code to everyone, they can just unpack it and you know, they have uh, the, all the data they need. Actually, it's not true because first of all, if you use any, any new modern JavaScript features that are not yet available in the uh, JavaScript engines running on the iOS and Android, the code needs to be transpiled. It needs to unwind uh, those advanced features into uh, more complex, older uh, solutions. And also, usually you're gonna get uh, like some minification going during the build uh, process. So the resulting file, you're gonna get like one huge JavaScript file that looks like someone uh, put a cat on a keyboard and let it run for like two hours. So I don't really like to work with JavaScript uh, on mobile apps. In my opinion, it's usually not worth the time because there is no, at least I don't know any of the good tools that can help you with uh, unscrambling that. So let's take a look at some examples. So let's start with Swift. Uh, this is a super simple function. Uh, it returns a billion uh, value if the user has paid for the app. And it reads that value from the user defaults. Uh, and yeah, that's all, all that it does. So now we're going to disassemble it. And this is what we're going to get. And it's totally unreadable. Like you probably cannot see anything. But luckily, we have tools to help us with that. So if we apply a decompiler to this code, we get something like that. It's a mix of C and Objective-C. It's a pseudocode. It's not supposed to compile, but it gives you some uh, idea about the flow of the program and what's going on there much in a much better way than the uh, disassembled uh, version. How does it compare to Kotlin? Uh, well, 
Again, we have a super simple function. The Android developer knew that no one's going to pay for the app, so he just hard coded false and figured that when finally someone pays, he will maybe change it. Uh, this is how it looks in Smiley. Like, you can see that we even get the uh, information about which line of code in the original source code was this uh, construct present. And we can see that it's basically initializing an, uh, one value and it returns it. And now if we um, uh, apply a decompiler to it, this is what we get. It's basically the same thing. Obviously, this was a super simple uh, example so that the decompiler didn't have much work to do. But this is what you can actually expect most of the time. Maybe some names will be harder to read. Uh, but still, it's basically what, you, uh, what you're going to get. The only difference is that it transforms it to Java because it's a Java decompiler. Uh, so now we have, like, now we know what we can expect. We have the tools. We have the somehow knowledge uh, how to do it. Let's have a quick demo. Uh, and I'm going to start with Android. So wait a second. Uh, I need to find my cursor. OK. So we're going to do all of the tests in the simulator or the emulator. Like doing this on the device would be super uh, hard to present on the, on the big screen. So uh, this is the first uh, emulator for the Android. I just installed one thing on it. It's the Frida server. It's the server that uh, runs on the device and allows me to inject code into all the other applications running uh, on it. So now I'm going to install my test app in there. Uh, wait a second. I need to find the proper. Uh, sorry, that bit. Wait, what's going on? Yeah, perfect. So we go into Android, and uh, we're going to unpack the original file. Uh, like I said, uh, I'm going to use the APK tool because uh, it does a lot of things for me, but APK files are basically zip files. You can just, just un unzip them, and you're going to get all of the contents. So I'm going to do that. Uh, just going to unfortunately take a while, but uh, I, I already did that. and. Uh, I can show you the decompiled code, so uh, I just need to find it. Yeah, here it is. So we are looking at the tool called uh, JDGUI. And I can see that it's the app contains only one activity. Uh, and there is, this, there is this my function of has paid for the app. It returns false as we expected. And then this function is used only in one place. It's called uh, here in the has paid for the, uh, sorry, in the, on the resume method. And if the user has paid for the app, the, uh, the view, the app container is being hidden. So obviously, if we want to get rid of the app container, uh, we want to return true from here. Just to make sure that this is how the app works, uh, I'm going to install it on the, on the simulator. Uh, input, yeah. So now we pushed it to the simulator. And if we run it, we're going to, no, not calculator. We're not going to calculate anything. Yeah, so we have this very simple ad with the ad container and main content. Again, the goal is to get rid of the ad container. So what we're going to do, we're going to use Frida for this tool, because uh, we, this is just a quick and dirty drop. Like We just want to see if our idea works. Uh, so uh, here's uh, the hook that we're going to use uh, in Frida. So we're going to use their scripting capabilities. And uh, basically, we're going to initialize uh, Java op uh, interoperability mode. We're going to try to find the main activity from the application. And then we basically take the has paid for the app, and we replace the implementation of that method with the return true. Uh, then later on, we just find the device, we, find, uh, we attach to the app, we create the script based on our code above, and we send that script uh, to the app. So let's try doing that. So and we can see that we attach and we have loaded the uh, hook. Wait. But uh, if we open our app now, that's the one. Yeah, the container disappeared. We, we didn't even have to push the new version of the app to the device. We did everything in the memory. Uh, and 
this way, like I said, it's quick, it's dirty, but you can have a lot of results, you can write them down and then come back later, modify the binary directly to achieve the same result. Uh, how does it compare to iOS? Well, on iOS, we're not going to use Frida, we're going to do the hard way, so we're going to basically be write writing assembly. Uh -huh. Luckily, again, we have the tools to help us with that, so here's the uh, iOS simulator. Uh, we're going to... Yeah, we need to kill this one. Okay, man. So we're gonna first of all need to unpack the app again. And I'm using a collection of script that I written just for this presentation, but what it does is basically unzip the file to a proper uh, directory where I know where the files will be. So I literally unzip the payload, and now I can uh, open the app in Hopper. And if everything goes well, yeah. Wait, uh, I need to put it on. Yeah, there we have the Hopper. Uh, we're gonna work on the 64-bit uh, architecture because this is what the, my computer is running, this is what the sim simulator is running. Uh, obviously, for the real app, you will be working with ARM and you will need to modify all of the architectures in the binary. Uh, if you want to redistribute it later. So after we load it into the hopper, we get a lot of assembly. Not really easy to read, but let's not focus on this anymore. Like, let's try to find the code that is actually responsible for presenting the, uh, the ad container. And I can immediately see some strings that m seem interesting. Like, there is something about the ad container. Uh, there is something about ha has paid for app. But uh, let's try to find the uh, function that does that. And I know that on iOS, uh, applications are built, like usually the screen has a UI view controller attached to it. So I'm going to start looking for a view controller. Uh, and yeah, I can see that there is only one. And uh, it has a getter and setter for the ad container, which I know that this is the view controller that controls that uh, part of the application. And uh, again, not being an iOS developer, I know that probably the majority of the logic is in the view did load function. Or at least if it's not there, there will be some reference to where to find it. So I'm going to jump in there. And again, plenty of assembly, not super easy to read, uh, not really helpful, but luckily we have this uh, decompiler built in. So if I go just here, I get this semi-readable code. I'm going to zoom in so you can see better. And I can see that uh, over here I'm uh, initializing the, uh, an uh, instance of user defaults. I uh, create an Objective-C string for the has paid for app, and then I check, like I get the Boolean value for that uh, key. And then later on, I, since, this is, uh, since this can retail, return an optional, I, I see if the option, uh, optional wasn't uh, nil. Uh, I unwrap the optional, and if the value under the optional was uh, not true, I set, uh, sorry, if the value was true, I set it to hidden. Uh, so this is probably the part of the code that we want to modify. Uh, a thing to note here is that the compiler actually inline our function, uh, something that didn't happen on the Android side. A Swift compiler decided that, you know, you are only using, like, it's just a simple function, I'm, I'm going to replace it everywhere, uh, so we're not going to have any calls, just direct, uh, direct copy. And uh, yeah, how do we get rid of that? Well, we could somehow make uh, this value under this register uh, to, be, uh, to be true, and then that would, that, would be, uh, that would get hidden. But if we take a look at the assembly again and look at this uh, comparison, we can see that uh, from the flow of the program that if this check is true, then we're going to jump over the hiding code. And the easiest solution for this problem is to just don't execute the jump. Like, no matter what the result of the, uh, of the, if, tra uh, if, the if, of the if clause, we want to execute both, uh, both statements. So uh, what we can do is we can basically NOP this uh, we can NOP this uh, instruction. 
a thing to note is that we need to check how many bytes this instruction actually takes, the original one. We can see that it's encoded as uh, two bytes, so, and we know that NOP instruction is just one byte, or at least the particular one that we're going to be using. So since we don't want to you know, realign everything else, we will just uh, insert uh, two NOP instructions. So it's still the same size, but, it's, uh, but it doesn't jump anymore. So if we do that, just that, and we decompile uh, this uh, procedure again, we can see that, yeah, the test still happens, but there is no condition uh, whether the, the view will be hidden or not. So what we can do now, we can uh, export this file, producing executable. Yeah, we need to remove the signature because the file was signed in originally, but since we are working with the simulator, the simulator doesn't really care if the file is signed or not, so we don't need to resign it anyway. So we're going to just save it again in the same directory. We're going to replace the app. And luckily, uh, hopefully, if we upload it again to the simulator, we're going to get a little bit different result this time. Oh, that's interesting. That's the beauty of doing live demos. Uh, let me try once more. I think maybe this is writing to our wrong file, actually. Uh, produce new executable, move. Demos workspace, backload. I hope this works. If not, unfortunately, uh, I don't want to spend three hours trying to debug what's going on. Uh, so you, you, you're going to need to trust me on it that it worked before. Yeah, unfortunately, I have no idea what happened here. Uh, probably, maybe I installed the wrong app. Okay, never mind. Like, this should work. Sorry for that. The beauty of live demos, it always happened, technical difficulties. Uh, but there's one more thing that I wanted to show you here. Uh, a very interesting... Um, thing that you can usually find in a lot of mobile apps are the API tokens. And let's do a quick search if the app contains some. And yeah, there is some uh, mention of an a API token being here. If we try looking where to find it, uh, yeah, there's just one reference and it's some information about the, about the Ivar, but seems like the value got in line, so we cannot, find the ref like, we cannot find it by reference, but maybe we can find it by, by value. And a thing that a lot of people do is that they're going to encode their uh, encode they tokens using Base64. And the thing with the Base64 is that it's super easy to search for, because almost every Base64 encoded string has some padding at the end, which is an uh, equal, uh, equal mark. And if we start looking for that, yeah, we can find that there is something that looks like a base 60, uh, 60, uh, 64 encoded string. So we're just going to copy that. Come on. So what? And let's see what does it actually uh, produce. Yeah. I promise I will not hack this up. Uh, so let's go back to the presentation. Uh, how do you prevent uh, from me doing exactly that? Well, the obvious solution is uh, code obfuscation. Uh, there is plenty of uh, obfuscators available. Even you have, like for Android, you have one built in into your tools. The ProGuard is a very simple obfuscator. Uh, it basically only removes the symbols, like it renames all of the classes and methods. But the paid, the professional version DexGuard can do a lot more. Uh, for C Sharp, I think the best one um, on the market, at least from the cheaper ones, is the ConfuserX. Uh, for Objective C, you can use iOS ClassGuard. Again, it will only replace uh, the names of the of the method and classes. It, it won't do anything other crazy. But there's plenty other commercial products uh, that cost a lot of money. And but the problem with them is that first of all, there are people that want to crack the, the apps. And they don't like the obfuscators, so they write the obfuscators. And it's, 
like basically usually a week or two after the release of a new version with the new patterns of some obfuscator, someone uh, in the middle of nowhere figures out the way to reverse that process and releases uh, the obfuscator. The other problem with obfuscator, uh, obfuscation is that the main principle usually is to make the code, the resulting code from the compiler, uh, much harder to read, much harder to understand. So they introduce a lot of uh, extra layers, uh, some very strange patterns that the compiler doesn't know how to optimize. And if the compiler doesn't know how to optimize something, it might get slow. So uh, if you have some mission critical code that like you depend on it running as fast as possible, you might want to test how does it uh, behave after being run through the obfuscator. Uh, usually, the, like the performance hit is not that big, but sometimes the, res the, the resulting uh, code is so weird that the CPU and the compiler just cannot, you know, figure out a smart way to do it faster, uh, and you can hit some bottlenecks. What's the other solutions? Well. You can uh, inline any door opening function. So we saw in this example we had uh, has, has user paid for app uh, method that returned a boolean. And on Android it wasn't in line. So if you use that method in like one, let's say 100 places in your app, I, I could just overwrite it once and uh, the, the work will be done. If you inline methods like that, then uh, Every, I, I would need to go to every single place the method is used and try to find how to make it work for this particular uh, scenario. Uh, usually compilers are quite smart about when to inline and when to not inline, uh, but if you have a function like that, it's, uh, in my opinion, a good practice to always inline it, just to add some extra time for the reverse engineer uh, in case that he's interested in, the, in your app. Again, also a thing that I've, uh, I believe would mostly be interesting for the Android, you can use lower le level languages for the mission critical code. So if you have something about certificate pinning or some uh, security checks in your app, uh, maybe some uh, checksum calculation, people are used to Android being super easy to reverse engineer. And there is a lot of people that don't really know how to uh, what, what to do when they, like when they see there is some C code in the app. Uh, so this could uh, block some you know, uh, entry-level reverse engineers from your app. Obviously, there are solutions to basically emulate a CPU and just throw uh, you know, this one piece of code and get the, get the result. But it's like, as with everything in the uh, reverse engineering, the only security you're going to get, you're going to get it through obscurity. Uh, another thing that we found in the app was that we were storing our tokens uh, unsecurely. And uh, it's a bad practice because, first of all, it can leak a lot of information. Like, uh, maybe you have an API that you use only partially in your app. So you don't use all of the endpoints or you don't use all of the return data. But uh, if I have the token, I can basically build my own uh, client and get all of the extra information that your API is providing uh, me. Or I could uh, contact like, third-party services in your name and get information about that too. Uh, another mm, vector of attack is that I can, like, if you use API that has rate limiting, I can just send millions of requests to that API and your app will be blocked from the API for the next hour or depending on your contract. And the same with the paid APIs. If I can use your token, you're probably going to have to pay for all of the requests that I make. Uh, so how do you store tokens securely? First of all, uh, if you shouldn't be using uh, global tokens for everyone. So like, if you hard code a token that goes into every installation of the app, like this is the game over. Like I can see it. I can. No matter how you uh, obscure it, there is a way to recover it back. So preferably, what you should do is uh, generate an API token for each user, so you have control over who is doing what, and you can block uh, weirdly behaving clients. Uh, 
the, you can try to not ship them with the binary. You can try using push notifications uh, as a secure channel of a delivery. Like Instagram used to do that, so they would send a silent push notification with the uh, API token for a given day or a week. And uh, if you're a total control freak, you can basically proxy all of the requests to all of the APIs through servers that you control. And again, then you can spot clients that behave weirdly and you can block them much easily. Uh, and also why this is important, this happened yesterday. Uh, there was a security conference and they had a mobile app. And obviously, if you go to a security conference, there is a lot of people interested in uh, security. And someone took the app, reverse engineered it, and found out that using the token, he was able to download the whole database of the, of the conference, uh, information about uh, speakers, uh, attendees, first name, last name, uh, sometimes even addresses. So yeah, you would think that people that do security conferences are secure. I guess not. So uh, securing your app is 10 to 1 effort. For every 10 hours you spend trying to make your app as secure from the reverse engineering standpoint, it will probably, like, at advanced uh, attacker will take one hour, maybe even less, to reverse all of those attempts because they already either, even, either have the tools that will automate the process because they've seen it before or they have the knowledge how to build those tools. So you need to look at this and think, okay, is it really worth it? Like, do I have anything in my app that is that interesting? Maybe if I do, maybe I should uh, move it to the server side. Maybe, uh, like, you need to find a golden ratio between this because attackers have all the time to attack. You don't have all the time to be secure. You need to write, uh, you need to write features, you need to fix bugs, I need to go to the meetings. So, yeah, usually they're going to win. Uh, and also, a very important thing is that not all reverse engineering is bad. Uh, it, without reverse engineering, we wouldn't have Fastlane, uh, because Fastlane uh, exists thanks to, the, thanks to someone uh, going into the Apple developer portal, looking at the API request, and basically uh, writing their own client. Uh, for the, also, like, there is a project called React OS. It's an uh, open source uh, Windows uh, compatible operating system where they didn't look at Windows source code at all. They basically reverse engineered everything from scratch in the clean room uh, way. Uh, and now they are able to redistribute. Uh, basically, like you can run all their Windows pro programs for free without having to pay for the Windows license, uh, without having to use Wine. It's a native, uh, it's, it's not a simulation like Wine. Uh, also, there is a lot of plenty open source games that have been reverse engineered. So, like, if you remember Transport Tycoon uh, or uh, uh, Team Hospital, those are very old games that uh, were written almost fully in assembly, and someone sit down, reverse engineered them, and built open source uh, replacements. So, it's basically the same game, but now it's open source, and uh, everyone can you know play with it. They don't need to pay the original producer. Uh, if you would like to learn more. I would definitely recommend the Begineers.re. It's a really good, um, it's a really good uh, guide on into the world of reverse engineering. Uh, it's targeted at the beginners, uh, but it uh, quickly starts speeding up and uh, ramping up the tempo. So uh, it's a really good read. Uh, if you already have some experience and uh, like you started looking at some apps, you found some issues. I definitely recommend going to the HackerOne. HackerOne is a bug bounty program where a lot of big companies are, uh, and they're going to pay you good money for uh, uh, submitting those issues to them. Uh, I think uh, one of the biggest uh, one on the HackerOne is actually Vcontacte. And they, like, every time that I go there, I see that, oh, they paid out $10,000 $10, to someone uh, because of there was some bug. On the other hand, if you are more into a uh, competition uh, side of things, there is uh, this concept of capture the flag events where you're basically given a computer program or computer problem that you need to hack. And somewhere in there, in this problem, this binary, uh, there is a flag that you need to capture. Uh, again, uh, very interesting uh, uh, concept, uh, I think, Two weeks ago in Singapore at one of the events, they actually had a mobile-specific uh, 
uh, task. So the people that went there had to reverse engineer a mobile app and try to find API token and then uh, contact some servers. So those are definitely the three resources that we recommend as the next steps, depending on where you want to go. And remember, uh, resistance is futile. Like, no matter how hard you try, there will always be someone that's going to break in and reverse, uh, reverse engineer your app. And with that uh, positive note, uh, let's go to the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, questions? Uh, thank you for the talk. It was really informative. My question would be this. You told that uh, once in a while someone uh, figures out how Java or Kotlin code is obfuscated with Dex Guard or ProGuard. As a reverse engineer, where do you look for that information on the web? What, what resources do you use? Uh, usually Twitter. Like I don't, I don't have any website to recommend. Uh, it just pops up in my feed. So unfortunately, I cannot uh, give you any any good point where like you could go. Uh, but basically, since I don't follow this very closely, like I only look for this when I had an app that has been obfuscated with this uh, with this particular obfuscator, and then I start looking for you know the information, and then I will find some obscure GitHub repository where someone figured it out like a week ago. Uh, so it's, it's, I, I wouldn't say it's hard to find, but it's also there's no like a central uh, repository of information about those kinds of things. But twi Twitter is a fruitful source of information in, yeah. th in this regard. Thank you. Uh, one, one person that I definitely recommend following on Twitter is Tavis uh, from Google. He's working at the Google security team and uh, he does a lot of uh, really cool uh, stuff with the reverse engineering. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, you said that uh, it's very easy to reverse engineer an Android app, much easier than all other kinds of apps, but then you said that uh, obscuring it uh, with uh, built-in tools like ProGuard uh, will help the developer to uh, protect the app from uh, people that want to reverse engineer. The question is, how much harder is it for you to reverse engineer an obscure app? Uh, like it depends on the level of obscurity. Uh, basically, the, the the first thing is that the ProGuard in the default settings doesn't do anything like that. Like the ProGuard is in the default setting only uh, looking at the ways to optimize the code, but it doesn't remove any of the symbols. So that's why I said that it's the easiest. Uh, when the app doesn't have the symbols. Uh, you still have some strings, like you, you know, messages that are displayed in the app, so you can somehow find your way around the app, and then you can start naming, like renaming things, so you know that this is a controller or activity that is handling the login. So maybe it's not going to be the original name, but as you go slowly, you will get more and more and more names, and like it's again, it's only adding more time. But if you know where, like, if you find uh, the place where t that you want to modify, then you don't care about the anything else. So if uh, all the symbols are removed and all the string literals are obfuscated somehow, it's going to be very hard for you to find. Yeah, but then, like, if the strings are obfuscated, then you notice this immediately because, like, every in every app there is uh, some kind of a string that is human readable. If I cannot find anything in your app, it means that you obfuscated it. So. I, the first thing I'm going to start looking into is how do I obfuscate those strings. So again, it's just adding another layer of obscurity that will take another, I don't know, maybe four or five hours or a day. But in the end, it's not blocking me from the access. Thank you. More questions? OK, let's, the last one. Thank you for a great talk. Uh, you mentioned one technique uh, to protect token is to use push notifications. Uh, but will it actually work? Uh, will it pass uh, a review to the App Store, for example, if the only way how app uh, will get its token is through push notifications? Because user can uh, always disable it. So uh, uh, you can like. 
what we can do is to have some kind of API that is publicly available to fetch a new token every time that you open the app, but then you can, like, if you detect that there is something wrong with the token that you have already distributed, it's being abused, you can push a new one securely uh, to the push notification. Okay, makes sense. Thanks. You're welcome. So, thank you very much. If you have more questions, let's go to discussion zone. Let's... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.